Hello, listeners, and welcome back to The Soul Row Show, where ancient feminine wisdom meets the modern path of soul evolution. I'm your host, Cherie Burton, and today we are diving deep into the realms of the sacred feminine with none other than my heroine mentor in this space, Dr. Anne Baring. She's the author of groundbreaking books like The Myth of the Goddess and Dream of the Cosmos. Her works are literally a beacon in the exploration of mystical traditions and the sacred feminine. So here's the thing. Anne is 92 years old and has another book coming out this year. We're going to explore Anne's personal journey of awakening that led her through a deep depression, realizing the crucial importance of the feminine principle and this path that would see her collaborate in this seminal work over the course of multiple decades. She is a Jungian analyst and has her PhD in that field as I said, an author of multiple books, but she's going to share her insights on historical Christian doctrines and the distortion that they brought in Mary Magdalene, who you know I'm a huge fan of, and the essential rediscovery of the Gnostic texts. I believe Anne's mentorship and wisdom culminates in this really beautiful, powerful clarion call to women everywhere to awaken to their destined roles in these critical times. Again, she is one of my heroines, and it was such a joy to have this conversation with her. Remember to follow me on Instagram at Sheree.Burton and ask to join our private Facebook group, Soul Rose Community, as we go deeper into this content each week. And when you ask to join our Facebook group, you'll receive my whole body healing mini course for free. Now, let's uncover the layers of the divine ground and the feminine aspect of the Godhead with the profound wisdom of Dr. Anne Baring. Hello, Anne. Hi. Thank you so much for this opportunity. You and I have been conversing back and forth via email And I was so touched by your generosity and your thoroughness with my questions. It's like, you've been a mentor to me from afar. (laughs) And now we've had this personal connection and it's just been so beautiful. You're in the UK. I don't know Mm -hmm. what time it is. It looks like it's still daylight there. It's five o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 10 a.m. here. So (laughs) I want to start just with, and I mentioned this to you before, but I think I'm so drawn to literally everything that you talk about, write about your messaging. It's just, I'm sure you've just been waiting for this era of humanity. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're 92. I I... So you've been waiting all this time to be able to probably <laughs> speak as freely as you had hoped you could decades ago. Yeah, that's right. I can speak now the way I want to speak. I can speak of who I am. I know I've come back into this world to do this work. I didn't know that until I was about 45 or 50 when I had the dream of the cosmic woman. And then I knew my work was to be dedicated to the restoration of the divine feminine. And so I've been working on that for 40 years now, 50 years, which seems a long time. But it's all gone by so quickly. I brought up a child and a grandson, Mm. a daughter and a grandson in the middle of that. And I've done masses of talks and webinars because this is the time when humanity has to wake up. And the main factor in waking up is the power of women to wake up to their own role in this crucial moment of choice, I call it, crucial moment of choice. And Mm -hmm. women's role is absolutely essential, but they're not uh, sufficient numbers of them who are awake yet. Right. Uh, They're still going on with their lives as usual sort of thing. And it's, they've got to become more focused. So I hope that this talk with you will help that along. (laughs) Well, I'm doing my part. And I had mentioned to you that a lot of my listeners have experienced different kinds of wounding around patriarchal institutions, around being silenced, around, I had mentioned to you, even just like not being, having autonomous control of our own bodies or having that stewardship over our own bodies to where we can make our own decisions that are relevant to what we want and desire. But, and I want to get to that, but I think the reason you inspire me so much is because you did have like the depth of your work after you turned a certain age is just like you became this, you know, I know you're familiar with the archetypal crone, (laughs) but that's how I see you. And a good, it's a good thing. People who aren't familiar with the crone, do you want to explain that archetype? Because I think it can be Really well, it's just, it, it originates with the fading of the moon originally 50,000 years ago when people connected the phases of their lives with the phases of the moon. So the crone phase is the fading of the moon prior to the dark three days of darkness and then the rebirth coming up to a new cycle, which is so beautiful, that lunar mythology, because it always gives the hope of the future, the recurrence of the pattern, the renewal of life. And so I'm preparing now to go into the other world and probably come back again in the renewal of another life. 
I'm not sure I want to come in the way that the world is at the moment. I think about that too. It's like, but, oh, do I really want to read? But I've seen huge changes in my life compared to my mother and my grandmother. They're colossal changes mm. in the lives of women. So women are, have far more opportunity to be articulate, to speak out, to be heard, and not to put up with the nonsense they've had to put up with for thousands of years. Mm. So, you know, yeah. it's woman's time, but they don't know it yet. And it's nothing to do with the empowerment of women. That's the wrong word. It's the awakening of women to their own value. That's what's yeah. important. I totally resonate with that. And you wrote The Dream of the Cosmos, A Quest for the Soul, which I'm holding up here for our YouTube watchers. Really high, dense, but in a very good way, dense, very deep, very soulful. You published it when you were 82, which I'm just, I, I told you I read it during COVID and I thought, wow, this, when did this come out? Oh, da, da, da. And I looked and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I know that she's in her 90s right now. This didn't come out till 10 years ago. So that, take us, I want some context around that. Like, just take us through how you just walked into this wise woman crone energy and just embrace that and continue to want to, I guess, produce is for lack of a better, you felt a compelling need or, or drive yeah. or draw to, to produce this work. Well, I knew that I'd been prepared for this even as a child when I was 13, because my mother had channeled messages from Jesus and St. Francis, who said that she had to prepare, but she couldn't prepare in those days. There was nothing she could do except to listen and take it all in. But I listened. And from the age of 13 to, say, 25, I was listening to these messages, and I could see that something needed to be done that she couldn't do. And so I unconsciously prepared myself for taking over the role that she might have had if she'd been in a more enlightened period, living in a more enlightened period. But in the middle of the Second World War, it was not the time for a woman to get up and say, I've had messages, et cetera, et cetera. She would have been ridiculed, laughed at. But now I've published a book of those messages, and they are absolutely relevant to the time we're living in. Mm. <clears throat> so I just trust the timing that in the other dimension, the transcendent dimension, there is no time. It's here on earth that we have the time sense. So what was right 80 years ago is now right today, so to speak. It, it was right for all time, if you like. So I was prepared and then I was prepared by a fantastic journey to the Far East when I was 25. And I spent a year traveling from country to country, collecting photographs of art for an Italian encyclopedia. And then I discovered Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism, all three. I had deep, deep, deep going into Did them. Did you and have reading a Christian background? Was your mother taking you to church or? No, not at all. She was American. She was a rebel, I think, like me. And she was brought up in a conventional way in the Christian tradition. And so was I. But I couldn't bear church. I absolutely hated it. I used to feel sick all the time when I was listening to it, we've sinned, erred and are strays like we're lost sheep. And I thought, the hell with that. I haven't erred and strayed like a lost sheep. <laughs> you know. So, so in your 20s, you just went off and had, it sounds like a little bit of a spiritual sojourn you were seeking. Yes, I had a spiritual journey and that woke me up because I was coming to a very conventional background, education at Oxford University in history and medieval history. But even so, I was completely unaware of any other spiritual traditions at the age of 25. I knew nothing. So I set out on this journey and my eyes were opened. It took a year. And when I came back, I wrote a book called The One Work, which, which you probably I have. Don't I, know. I, I, I paid for that book. That's it's amazing. not easy to find. <laughs> no, it isn't. No. So I wrote that book and then I thought, well, things will open out. But they didn't because that book was not understood by the people living at that time. I think it had one review or something. It had a few reviews from people in India who gave it great praise. But I had a depression. So with the depression, I went into Jungian analysis because I couldn't understand why I was so depressed. But the reason I was depressed was that the culture I was living in had yeah. no room for the ideas I was trying to bring through. Absolutely. So I felt outsider. I see depression as soul sickness. I don't know if that's how you it see it. It is soul sickness. Yes, it, it's so longing to be recognized. And so people then get depressed and they get think, go and get antidepressants. There are thousands and thousands of women in this country who take antidepressants when really their soul is crying out for attention, but they don't know they have a soul. Yeah. So there we are. Yeah. So you went through this depression and it drove you to understand yourself first. I take it you found a practitioner, a young analyst. Yes, through a friend who recommended somebody who was a man. 
and I stayed with him for 11 years. And then I applied for training with Dr. Gerhard Adler, who was then head of one of the groups in, in England. And he said, oh, that's fine, I'll take you on, but you've got to have a, two more years analysis with my wife, Ella Adler, which I did, and then we can accept you for training, which they did. Then there was another seven years of training after that. So it was a long time. Wow. I was 11 years in the first analysis and 11 years in the second while I was doing my training as an analyst. So I really, and she was the one who introduced me to the importance of the feminine, Hella Adler. I owe it to her that mm. I really began to understand what it was about and what has been excluded from our society. And then I met Jules Cashford, was training with me on that analytical course. And we got together. We, she came to my house for supper. And we said, look, we've got to do a book about the feminine principle. And so we planned it in four hours. We planned the whole book from the Paleolithic era right up to the Virgin Mary. Mm. And and it took us 10 years to write while we were training as analysts. I absolutely love that book. It's marked up too, just by the way. Yeah, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. And people, all women should read it so that they know the archetypal history of that. Term. Can you give the full title of that book? Because it's escaped me. The Myth of the Goddess, Evolution of an Image. Mm. The Myth of the Goddess, Evolution of an Image. I appreciate its academic rigor. Yeah. And I can, that's another thing that I appreciate about you is you have an academic scholarly background, but you're also bringing in consciousness. You're also bringing in the, you know, you've got the archaeological, beautiful images that, that were presented there and the art and the history and the literature. But you're also bringing in this element of soul, which yeah, is very well, that's young. Jungian. Of yeah. course, that's Jungian. So I'm putting the two together. And in my other books, The Mystic Vision, for instance, I've gone through the different uh, traditions of in the mystical traditions with Andrew Harvey. I wrote that book. And that. then we wrote together The Divine Feminine. Mm -hmm. a small both of those are small books but they're valuable because they show what's been excluded and, and lost all this great mystical teaching that we've lost and i want to get back to your story but i also want to just emphasize here for our listeners that you are writing another book based on the gnostic teachings and texts on the holy spirit and i want um, to talk about that more exact what it's themed yeah, it's around. not it's not exactly that the gnostics are part of it but the actual title is divine wisdom and the holy spirit the lost aspect of the Godhead. Yeah. The forgotten, for, the forgotten aspect of the Godhead. Forgotten aspect, which is all around, obviously, the forgotten feminine. And it's struggling to come back now in all kinds of ways. In the world we have now, it's desperately needed because people simply don't, they're stuck in the patriarchal format and they can't get out of it because it's like being in a prison. They don't know how to get out and they're influenced in every direction by it, mm -hmm. educated into it. The whole workplace is predicated on it. The whole foreign policy of countries is steeped in it. So we it's really killing our planet. It's killing our planet. The hierarchy, the peace. It's killing the planet. And the messages said that. They said, if you could go on with war, you will destroy the planet, not only yourselves, but the planet as well. Mm -hmm. So I really took that to heart. And that, that came when I was, as I say, when I was about 25. That, So I've kept all my mother's messages from that time. I inherited them when she died. And then last February, I thought, well, I will record these with a lovely program called Dragon, where you just speak into the text and it comes up with the words that you're saying, mm. which is wonderful. Dragon is a great name for that, too. <laughs> I, I didn't have to type it, you see. Yeah, yeah. So it saved me hours of typing, and I could produce this book in a couple of months, which would have taken years if I'd had to type it. Anyway, that's what they said. If you don't stop wars, you will destroy the planet. And this came through your mother decades ago. Yeah, a mother and a friend. It came through in 1943. So when you entered sort of, I guess you could call it maybe your dark night, where you were experiencing the depression, you were having the symptoms in your body, you had, you were probably on this heroine's journey where you're trying to, we're all on the heroines and heroes journey, but you probably reached a point at which you were feeling the call. And it oftentimes will, as an initiation, show up in our physical bodies as a depression or health crisis. But you had these Jungian Sounds like a really, really adept, probably divinely planted, this woman that you talked about. Well, I had help when I yeah. needed it. And also I had this fantastic dream of a cosmic woman. Which I would love for you to alliterate for us. Would you let me not to yeah. now? Yeah, I would love that. Okay, well, what it was, I, it was in my mid-40s, I think. The dream was that I was, it was a full moon night, night of the full moon. And I came to a huge dolmen like the ones on Stonehenge. And I went round the corner of it. And I came into a different world, which was just a world of green corn, as far as I, the eye could see. 
and I, my feet were gliding over the top of this corn. I wasn't walking through it. I was skimming over the top of it with my feet, with my bare feet. And this went on for a long time. And then I came to a sort of valley on a dip and I thought, should I go on? And then I saw that there were two gigantic men each side of the valley holding a huge net uh, which covered the floor of the valley. And then I found myself caught in this huge net, lying on my back and gazing up to the sky. And as I looked up, I saw this gigantic figure of a woman. She was naked with long hair, beautiful young woman she was, but she wasn't any of the goddesses that I knew about. She didn't resemble any of them. And so I wondered who she was. And she had a gigantic sort of either a wheel or a labyrinth in her abdomen. And I looked down at my body and I saw that I had a wheel or a labyrinth in mine, but it was on the left. And she indicated that I was to center my wheel. That was to be my work. And centering my wheel meant becoming more conscious. Mm. So she didn't say anything, but that was the message, center your wheel. And that's what I did after that dream, which was a fantastic visionary dream, the kind of dream that people used to have, but have stopped having because they've been ridiculed and people have thought people were mad who were having dreams like that. So because I was in analysis, I could speak about it with my analyst, Hella Adler, and we could sort of go into it. But we couldn't go really very far. I didn't know who it was until writing The Myth of the Goddess, I realized that it was the Shekhinah of Kabbalah, mm. because it absolutely fitted this image of the divine feminine, who was partner of the divine masculine in Kabbalah. And here was the tradition that I really felt at home in, although nothing to do with the Jewish religion or background, no Jewish background in my family at all. But I was absolutely knew that this was something I had known in other lives because I knew that I'd had many lives and I was brought up with that idea. So it wasn't new. So that's really what happened. I was attracted to Kabbalah and the third chapter of The Dream of the Cosmos is about that and describing absolutely marvelous imagery of the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. And this is what's yeah. been missing in Christianity and yeah. in Judaism because Judaism wiped out the goddess. And in Islam, all three are missing the feminine divine image. So this was all interesting. I didn't see quite where it was leading, but then as the years went on and I saw things were getting worse and worse in the world, I thought, well, really, this has to be something that reaches more people, as many people as possible. I've done what I can, but we need to reach millions, not just thousands. And this is the, uh, in every culture, women in every culture, Africa, South America, China, mm. India, everywhere. Yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't put this together until you shared your story about centering in the wheel. But I was awakened in the middle of the night in 2008 and shown a compass, which is why I have a compass branding with my business. But it, I've since developed it into a 16-point creation compass but I only saw four points and a middle point when I was shown it. And it's, I'm kind of in this suspended state of like, maybe I need to go back and read my journal when I had the dream, because it's very similar to what you're talking about. I knew mm -hmm. that the compass was on a body, a woman's body. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about, by the way, it's about love, giving and receiving love and power. So love is north, power is south. The middle point is stillness or void, you could say, the midpoint of silence, stillness and creation. Silence, that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And then the east-west quadrants are receiving gifts. So the feminine side is represented on the left. The masculine side is represented on the right about giving and then receiving. So anyway, I thank you for sharing that. I had read about your story and what you had seen before, but I hadn't put it together until you you had just said, center your wheel. And I'm like, oh, that's the message I got as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the divine ground. I've watched a lot of your YouTube presentations. Of course, I've read a lot of your work. And you talk about the divine ground a lot. And I would love for you to define for us what that means, has come to mean for you. It's not some, a phrase we typically hear a lot. Well, as a human species, we've created an image of what we imagine, a concept of what we imagine to be the divinity, which is that we put up in the sky as God, but before it was the whole of nature as well as the whole cosmos. So that is really the creative divine ground from which we have come and that we're part of. And we've given it many names like the divine feminine or the divine masculine, God the Father, Allah, Yahweh, whatever. But they, these are all images or concepts that we've projected onto this ground, I call it, divine ground. 
which we are part of, but we haven't realized we're part of it because we've always been taught that we were separate from it. It was up in the sky somewhere and that we were very far away from it. So what's coming in quantum physics is the fact that everything is connected to everything else. There's nothing that is disconnected in the whole universe. Three trillion galaxies are connected to each other and to us here by the minute particles of what we call matter, which is not matter at all, but energy. So that is, I mean, quantum physics with Nassim Haramein. I did a course with him in 2014, I think it was in which I learned about the unified field and how everything is connected. And that was a revelation because here I saw we are not separate from the divinity that we've been worshipping for thousands of years. We are part of its life and we are create co-creators with it. If only we knew it, we've been destroyers a great deal of the time because we didn't know who we were or what we were doing here on this planet. And we were distressed and unhappy and frightened. And so we created these images. But I don't think until we come to quantum physics, I don't think we've had a true picture of how everything is connected. Yeah. We knew it from the original great mother cosmology because everything came forth from her womb. So everything was connected through her. And we're coming round at a new level with quantum physics to realize that everything is connected. Again, we don't have the concept of the great mother anymore, but we have the concept of a connected universe mm -hmm. and ourselves as part of that connection which I think is a most exciting and interesting idea. But it also goes back to the idea that when the goddess was, or the great mother was the creator, everything was part of her being. There was no separation. And when you had the God, you had God up in heaven creating the earth down here, separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that separation changes everything because we are not part of the God anymore. We are part of what has been created by the God. It's quite a different concept. Yeah, and I think some people that would say that borders on hereticism or blasphemy to say that we are part of that. Well, so what? I know, it exactly, right? <laughs> it's just like, I'm with you on that one. It's just, that's the greatest lie that we've ever been Yeah, just make, it's make you, keeping you down again, telling you that you're a bit sinful and bad, just like the myth of the fall did. You know, you've made a great mistake and you've got to pay for it. You've got to be punished. You've got to go to earth and leave the Garden of Eden. All that scenario. Born in got sin. To go. <laughs> yeah, born in sin. In my religion of origin, you and I have conversed a bit about this, but is Mormonism. And part of the theology is it's a little more Eve friendly, I would say, than some other Christian denominations that I've heard about. But they still don't give full representation to the feminine, even though they say we have a heavenly mother. That's actually in Mormon theologies that we have a heavenly mother. But then they've reduced it to heavenly parents. And they won't even mention a heavenly mother singularly. They've actually come out in the last conference and said, don't pray to her. The, the apostles and prophets are saying, we don't know anything about her. And I'm like, well, well, I do. You know what I mean? So I'm with you. It's like, who cares? We who cares? are at this <clears throat> pivotal point in history where there's a hunger, a literal hunger to know more about what is the divine ground of the feminine? What is this? Where is she? Why is she missing? Why was she excluded? Hey, just a little break in the discussion to remind you about what I alluded to in the intro, which is that Mare will be coming in to do a live Gaia group meditation in our Soul Rose Facebook community on Monday, May 13th, the day after Mother's Day at 11 a.m. Mountain Time for just about 40, 45 minutes. Ask to join our private Facebook group, Soul Rose Community, to be in the know about this powerful time. And as a Mother's Day gift to yourself, even if it's a day after the fact, consider coming in and connecting with Earth and these powerful feminine forces with Mare as our facilitator. Well, I think this is all coming back because of the interest in Mary Magdalene. People are beginning to think about this more intently, really. And Mary Magdalene has had a huge influence because she, that is something that's coming back too, possibly guiding us to wake up to our feminine value because her history is the most terrible example of what the patriarchy did to the wife of Jesus, Yeshua. Yeah. And this is all going in my book as well, because if those of you who are listening would like to listen to the talk I gave on Mary Magdalene, yes. you'll find the history there of what happened and how she was demonized by Pope Gregory the Great and named as a sinner and a, I don't know what, of all the vices. Basically a penitent prostitute. And that those ghastly paintings of the penitent prostitute 
looking through her hair and clutching her breasts and I don't know what. You know, that was the way that she was presented for 2,000 years nearly to the Christian audiences. Imagine what she must have felt up in heaven or wherever she is, seeing all this rubbish put out about her and seeing people believing it. I think that I feel a fierce, this is, I share this with you too, but Mary Magdalene is what woke me up. Literally her presence, her archetype, the Gnostic texts, it's just, she literally called to me, found me and woke me up. And it was, there was a fierceness to it an urgency. Yeah, and, well, there is, she's right. Yeah. And I, and I see her as very much, a, and I'm sure you would agree very much a Christed, a feminine Christed being, and obviously the anointer of Jesus. But what's the most fascinating thing to you about what you've uncovered about Mary Magdalene? Well, her book, her gospel, which people don't know about, it's called the gospel of the beloved companion. It's available on Amazon, not expensive at all. And it's the gospel she wrote, I think, when she was in Alexandria, because she had to leave Palestine because of persecutions had begun there on the the Nazarenes, which were the early Christian community there. And I think she went to Alexandria. Jesus, as a Yeshua's uncle, was Joseph of Arimathea, who used to supply the Roman army with tin, which he got from England, from Cornwall. And he had a huge fleet of ships based in Cyprus, as well as Alexandria. So it was quite easier for her to get from Palestine to Alexandria and then later on to France. And she wrote the gospel, I think, in Alexandria, in Alexandrian Greek, which was called. And then it was taken to France when she went there in AD 44, I think it was. And she stayed 20 years teaching in France. She was an Essene priestess. Mm -hmm. She was also a priestess of Isis, a high priestess trained in the Egyptian temples as a priestess of Isis. So she took that teaching with her to France, and there's a great deal of residual evidence there that she was there, that she taught there, and that she was known. And the teaching went into the image of the Black Madonna in France, of which there are 450 examples of the Black Madonna. And that is someone called Dr. Anine Van der Meer. Thank you for recommending her book to me. I have been absorbing it. It's quite beautiful indeed. Right, And it absolutely proves, this is the second part of that, that gospel, is that in AD 80 or 90, somebody called John the Elder, who was living in Ephesus, copied her gospel and called it the Gospel of John. And that is the fourth gospel that we know as the Gospel of John. It's actually a copy, not an exact copy, because he made lots of changes. He redacted lots of her gospel and changed it to what he wanted to fit in with the Christian teaching. But anyway, (laughs) that gospel of John is really her gospel underneath. And it's hers is the first and only eyewitness account of what Jesus did, what Yeshua did. So from that point of view, I think it's fascinating. And all this is proven in a book by Dr. Anine van der Meer called Mary Magdalene Unveiled, which is a huge book and very small print, unfortunately, but it couldn't, it would have been twice the size of it, it had been large print. And I would urge people to read that and they will see the whole story there. And you know, they will see where the distortion comes in and where the Mary Magdalene, who was married to Yeshua, and just before, th- three years before the crucifixion, I think, Anyway, the whole story is there unfolded in front of you if you read her book. And I think people should know about this and just stop all this nonsense about Mary Magdalene having been a prostitute and everything. And she was a great teacher. She was actually named teacher to the disciples just before the Last Supper. And he gave her the title of the Migdala, which means the tower. And there was a tower at the back of the first temple in Jerusalem where the high priest used to commune with the Queen of Heaven. He used to go up steps and to the roof probably and commune with the divine feminine. In that first temple in Jerusalem where Asherah, the queen of heaven, was so honored, worshipped. Yeah, as divine wisdom, as the Holy Spirit, those were her titles, and as the tree of life, which gave the fruit of immortality to those who understood the meaning of it. So this is all there in that book of of Anin's, which is, I think, absolutely wonderful. And she was the pupil of Professor Gilles Quispel in Amsterdam, who was the great Gnostic scholar who translated, one of the translators of the Gospel of Thomas, which was discovered in the Nag Hammadi texts, which were discovered by a man just finding the bars. Or something or someone in. He was just a peasant. 
really, yeah. and he was looking for earth to plant some seeds, probably better earth. And he looked in these caves because they're masses of caves, and he found this red china jar, and he broke it, and inside were all these codices, which are another name for books. 52 texts inside the codices, and some of them he took home to his mother to use as fire, uh, fuel for her fire. Oh, that just makes and the, me sick, and the rest it? managed somehow to get to Egypt, the capital, and to the Coptic church there, I think. Anyway, they were rescued. And because of that rescue, we know that there was a people called the Gnostics who had a totally different view of the teaching of Jesus, that God was both mother and father in some of the texts, and the divine feminine was very present. I'm putting one of the texts into my book. This all needs to come out. This has been concealed for 2,000 years. The Nag Hammadi text and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, it's like the greatest theological find of the century. Yeah, Centuries, it is. Yes. Yeah. And you would think that the churches would just be all over it, right? Somehow there's this belief that we got this ancient text, then the Old and New Testament that has gone through many hands and many iterations and councils to get the version we have now. And that somehow that that is the only text out there that can well, support a full spiritual view of where we are, where we came from, where are we going and the divine partners. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that, this all happened in 325 CE with under the Emperor Constantine when they had a great council there. And in that council, they actually formulated the myth of Jesus as the only son of God and that Christians would have that only son of God to worship, so to speak, and to look after them. And so that was where it started, 325 CE. And it's gone on ever since then. And then the next council was 451, which was the Council of Chalcedon, where the Virgin Mary was declared to be God-bearer and where Jesus had an immaculate conception. That was kind of settled at that conference. And then also Theodosius, another emperor at the end of the fourth century, said that anyone who doesn't agree with the creed formulated in 325 would be named a heretic. That's where heresy came in. And that was in 381 that he said that. So you have the fourth century as crucially important as the formation of the Christian doctrine and teaching. And they just built on it as they went along. Finally, in the 19th century, you've got the Immaculate Conception of Mary herself, as well as the Immaculate Conception of Jesus. But these were all formulated by men theologians. And don't you think it was largely because they saw sexuality? It's actually like, you know, the, like the central like women and sexuality is the downfall of humanity. They were terrified of sexuality. They really did consider it the root of all evil and that women were the, the cause of tempting men into sexuality yeah. through their attractiveness. And so women were anathema, really. Women were the problem and sexuality was the problem. So they all became celibate. Celibacy became in, I can't remember the exact date, but the church became celibate and disaster from then on. You can be sure that there were thousands of little boys abused by the male priesthood, mm. thousands of, of not little girls so much, but the boys who were training for the priesthood, all abused probably going right the way back to fourth century. Mm. So, you know, it's just a horrific scenario and they're completely blind to all of this and they stick to the thing about the only son of God which the yeah. Gnostics were horrified by, and the Gnostics formed their group, groups, Not they were already formed, but there were great Gnostic teachers like Hypatia in Alexandria in the 5th century, about 400 AD CE, is what she was teaching. And she was killed by a Christian mob who pulled her off her carriage and mm. pummeled her to death, really. It was terrible death. So you had opposition to the Gnostics coming in. The Gnostics said, this isn't good. Your idea of having the only son of God is going to lead to terrible wrongs because you're going to try and convert people to the true religion, which has what happened. You're going to kill people who are not of the true religion, which is what happened. And you're going to get a huge inflation. You're going to get inflated with pride that you, the church, are the repository of the teaching of the only son of God. And all this they could see would lead to terrible wrongs, which they have. I mean, it led to the persecution of all the indigenous people in America and South America. Yeah. Appalling crimes. Colonization, doing and justifying whatever atrocity in the name of God. I want to go back to the, the one son of God, because I, I feel like for some people, that's a hard pill to swallow for us to, you know, make that statement. But 
I think what Jesus was actually really teaching and pointing to is that we are all quote unquote sons. And exactly. All, all men and women are all he, the children of was, God. Yeah. Well, he was pointing to that and they have somehow made this empire Jesus, you know, and marketed him as someone who is vengeful and controlling. I mean, and also super loving. So our psyche hasn't known how to, I was taught that Jesus is the Jehovah of the old Testament some people believe in the Trinity and which we'll get into as just this all male Trinity of Father, Son, Holy Ghost as one. I was taught that they are three separate personages, of course, all male. But the point I'm making about the one son of God is that we can't have this open, like you're talking about these councils in Rome and what have you. They, we, Ephesus and, and you know, the, the Council of Nicaea, and they wanted to, they, it was like control because if people just started dipping into their heart and connecting as their own child of God that they are with this. And Jesus even said to his disciples, greater things that you've seen me do, you will do. He was always saying the kingdom of heaven is within. There were all these wisdom teachings coming forth, some of which made it into the New Testament, thankfully. But it was almost like a scrambling for control because if everyone is just this rogue agent who knows that they are divinity and they come <laughs> from love, like, things are going to spiral out of control really fast. Well, I do see their point because they didn't know what to do with all the Gnostics and they destroyed their gospels as much as possible because there were, there were many, many, many Gnostic gospels and each one was a bit different and each one seeing yeah. something, things. So what, what you've just said happened, that there were many different interpretations and they thought we can't have this. We have to have one single interpretation of the work of Jesus and it will be this. And that's what they said, but they, they had no comprehension of the fact that perhaps there's value in multiplicity. There may be other points of view which are valuable. And we have this same thing coming up now in our cancelling culture. Yeah. That there has to be only one viewpoint, one truth. Yeah. It's the same phenomenon. Same thing. And every religion thinks they're the one that has the truth. Yeah. But also now every anybody thinks that they have the truth. They don't tolerate there's lots any of Gnostics that and, and I mean, you know. It's interesting because this rugged individualism, if you will, that has been pretty alive in America, they are the manifest destiny and the colonization and the, like you said, the canceling culture and the exploitation of the indigenous and all of those beautiful healing arts that were lost. I would say like, even in the name of God, that was manifest destiny. And that's definitely what happened where I live, you know, in Utah, where there were several indigenous tribes and and the Mormon settlers came here and sort of took it over. Mm. It's a whole other thing, but I want to get into it in our time remaining, because I feel like we could just keep talking, 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 but I want to talk about what I have always felt that you are now backing up. And it makes me feel so good that the Holy Spirit is feminine, the Holy Absolutely. Spirit, the Holy Ghost, whatever. I was taught that this is literal Mormon theology in Mormon scripture, that the Holy Ghost is the form of a man, okay? An actual man. Naturally. <laughs> and so as a girl, yeah, as a girl, as a young girl, when I would feel what we call the spirit, where I would feel those fruits of the spirit, like good feelings, or I would feel something spiritually elevating, let's just say, I would think I'm feeling, oh, that's the spirit. Oh, that's the Holy Ghost. Oh, a man just came and, and made me feel good. That I'm very visual, so I would just envision as a girl this holy ghost man coming and dwelling in my heart and filling my bosom and lighting me up and make me feel warm and fuzzy. But as I got older, I'm like, it just makes so much sense that it would be feminine because it's always there. But the sinister teaching is if I did something wrong, it would leave. If I offended the spirit, it would go. And as I've become a mother, I'm like, mothers don't get so offended that they take off. Like, Mothers are always there cleaning it up, cleaning up the diapers, you know, being ever present. And then I had this epiphany in my 40s, like, of course. And that's reminding me of the divine ground we're speaking of. You can't separate yeah. them. No, you also, are teaching about mother being the Holy Spirit. So I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes back to the Paleolithic and the Neolithic when the great mother was worshipped as the only being, divine being that they knew about then. And then it changed to the great father. But I think also what women have not realized at all is that from, from the very beginning of our history on the planet, they have brought new life into being. They have carried life in their womb. They have the experience of carrying life and caring for life all the way through. 
They've been the carers. The men have been the protectors, which is also very necessary. But the women have been the carers. They've prepared the food. They've looked after the ill when, when that happened. They've looked after the dying. It's always women who looked after the dying. You won't see a man anywhere near <laughs> you know, the, the last yeah. moments unless they're very close family. So the, the whole formation of woman is simply ignored of the importance of it as carriers of life. And as carriers of life, they feel things through their heart very deeply. The heart is the medium of connection to the soul. The heart is the organ of connection, if you like, to the, mm -hmm. to the soul. Feeling is absolutely vital. And we put all the emphasis on mind and the marvelous things that we can do with mind. And we completely ignored, when I say we, I mean the culture, completely ignored the importance of the heart and what can be learned from the heart and from that feminine experience of caring, loving, touching, stroking, preparing food, cutting up food, putting it on the table, washing up afterwards, as you say, cleaning the diapers. It's the day or in the life of what we naturally are. And this, this is what we're gifted to do. And this is what our great gift to humanity is. Without us producing these women in our womb, there would be no humanity. And you can be sure that men are now working how to create a child in the test tube and not in a woman's womb. That's the next step. We can be immortal. That's what they're working on now with AI. Mm. And also we can produce life if we want. We don't need woman anymore. Mm. That's the next step. Yeah, the utility of a woman has just been in support of an agenda, I, you could say, in many arenas, in many organizations. But as we kind of close out, I want to talk really quickly about the gospel of the beloved companion. It didn't even come out until 2010, I believe. And that's right. Yes, it was released. They decided the community that had guided it for 2000 years decided that it was the time to bring it out because the world re really needed it. And in that gospel, uh, the Holy Spirit is feminine all the way through. So it was she or her that Jesus speaks of. So that was the primary thing that I found. Good God, this gospel is using the feminine yeah. noun, as it were, to describe the feminine aspect of God, guiding Jesus. And so when in the baptism, when you hear the voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, it's the mother speaking, the divine mother. It's not the divine father. Mm. And that was discovered by Chris Bell. He actually pointed to the gospel of the Hebrews where that was forward, that idea that it was a feminine. Yeah, well, um, with it, when the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, that's a very yeah. feminine representation, even in the New Testament. I'm like, that's got to be mother. There's got to be this influence of mother. Well, it is. And the, the dove was sacred to the divine feminine going back to the Paleolithic. You can find in, well, not the Paleolithic, but the Neolithic, that the bird and the dove particularly is the symbol and the messenger of the great mother. Mm -hmm. So that's what she was coming to, to bless Jesus as he was baptized. And I had asked you that in an email, and I was so grateful to hear you confirm that with your research. And, and I'm absolutely sure about that. And Chris yeah. Bell, I mean, I take him as the authority on that. And also Anin, uh, his pupil, there's no question about that that was it. But you won't hear a breath of that in the in the Gospels. No. So it's so we live in this time of the restoration of the feminine. I want to kind of round out with this quote, this Jungian quote that you have in your book, Dream of the Cosmos. How were the years that I know he was a contemporary of Freud, but do you remember what years Jung was, Carl Jung was alive? Um, oh, Lord, I, I can't. I know, I have to look at it. But anyway, he, he talked about well, he sort of, for me, the father of like soul psychology or spiritual psychology, a lot of people, there's, it's like his teachings have made this great resurgence because they just are so relevant for our time. And we're coming into an era where people can digest a little bit more of the depth he was going into. But I want to read this part right here. He said, God himself, and you have quoted this in one of your, yeah. in one of your latest presentations, God himself cannot flourish if a man's soul is starved. The feminine psyche responds to this hunger, for it is the function of Eros to unite what Logos has sundered. The woman of today is faced with a tremendous cultural task. Perhaps it will be the dawn of a new era. And that was, I think, in the 40s that he was alive. I want to say, I, I can't. No, he's quite... alive later because we really, we could have gone to see him when we got married in 1960. Hmm. And I think he must have died around that time, 60, 61. 
but you go on to sort of extrapolate a little bit more what his what he was saying there and you had some really but I want to read this part of what you wrote after that woman's own awakening is part of the recovery of the feminine it is as if a momentous birth is taking place in the collective psyche of women this birth may be experienced as something that is difficult and even dangerous as well as something exciting and transformative the planet needs women to challenge the current established political ways and deplorable struggles for power and awaken for humanity or for human community to awaken human community to a higher destiny and a different goal. It needs women to come out of the dark, to emerge into the light, to become visible and audible, to take the initiative in creating the change they long for. I just want to just hold that up. It's just a very powerful thing that you've written there. Any parting words around that or anything you want to add more to our discussion around this resurgence and restoration of the feminine? No, I think really that says it all. But there is an urgency now because of the things that are going on. We're moving towards more wars everlastingly. And if we don't stop that pattern, we will destroy not only our species, but the earth itself. And we really have to wake up to that fact. So I think that's my, my last words. We need to wake up. Yeah, well, thank you for the work that you're doing to facilitate that in so many. I just want to also give you a different perspective on the books that you've written that you don't think, you know, have had much receptivity. I think it's found the right people. I think it's found the people who will move forward this evolution of consciousness. And I think that just with your emphasis on the Magdalene and what you're speaking to there, like you were way ahead of your time before it did hit more of this like spiritual, you know, people that are spiritual seekers finding that. So I just want to honor your work and, and give you that fresh perspective that, that your work has found already found the right people and is continuing to find more people probably that you have no idea of the scope of, I know that your work has helped to awaken parts of me and has guided my path, both in research and also just my own soul development. So Thank you so well, that, much. That, that's so lovely to hear. So, Sherry, absolutely balm to my soul because you work in great loneliness with this work. You're not, you haven't got I, people. I around totally, to I totally <laughs> know what you're saying. It's And so you, you have to accept it. Yes, you have to accept that in this incarnation, you may be all by yourself. Yeah. But when you have that connection and you know in your in the depths of your being in your heart and soul that you are answering a call and that you're soldiering on with that it doesn't matter what people think and no, you, that's part of the crone too right <laughs> and i think it's so important that we know that there is a reason that we're here on this planet there is a destiny that we're, we're moving towards and we need to know it and love it and really love and light are the two things which the divine ground gives forth those two things so that's my last words really love and light to remember those two images as we go through our lives thank you Anne. okay thank you sherry so nice to meet you you too hey it's sheree here have you gotten my free whole body healing kit mini course all you have to do is ask to join our private facebook group soul rose community and we'll send it right to your inbox and i want you to know that i am so grateful for every single one of you who listens to these episodes you can follow me on Instagram at Sheree.Burton to deepen into the discussion that you heard today. And I would be ever so grateful if you would leave this podcast a positive review on Apple Podcasts. This allows many more people to find these kinds of healing and empowerment gems that we bring forward in our discussions. And if you want to see our faces, check out my Soul Rose Show YouTube channel. Have a glorious week and we'll talk to you next time on the Soul Rose Show.